flight director has confirmed separation. Separation of the command module and the service module. We've been looking at data on the command module alone, and all the values look quite good. This is Apollo Control at Houston. And so separation has taken place. Uh, we did, they did not say it took place on that uh, nominal schedule, but all systems look good, so apparently things are going well with the flight of Apollo 8. Now it re-enters the atmosphere at that critical moment, uh, which is 10.37 Eastern Time, and that's uh, just about 12 minutes from now. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 8 will continue in a moment. The uh, Apollo spacecraft is now on its own. It does not any longer have its uh, service uh, system with it, with the service propulsion system engine. It can do nothing now but return uh, into Earth uh, atmosphere, as it should be doing now just uh, about uh, 10 minutes from this point. A moment ago, before we interrupted him to talk about the separation maneuver, uh, we were talking to Leo Krupp out at uh, the North American Rockwell plant in Downey, California, in our mock-up capsule there, about the way the spacemen can monitor in a, uh, in a system uh, displayed immediately in front of command pilot Frank Borman, uh, their exact entry trajectory, and whether they're in that narrow corridor within the two degrees that they're permitted uh, deviation uh, for a safe landing. And uh, Leo was showing us that system. As I gather, they must come between two of those lines on the graph we showed you a moment ago. Do anything about uh, those lines if they begin to get outside of those uh, curving lines? Uh, yes, Walter. As I was explaining, uh, coming in, uh, the, the trace will be coming down rather steep. Now, he does have lift vector up at this time, so he'll just maintain lift vector up. The vehicle will, will plunge into the atmosphere and, and the G's will increase to about six G's, at which time the lift of the vehicle starts to take effect and the, the trace will curve upward and the G's will start to decrease. Now, the lines going in, in this direction across the scope are skip-out rays. Now, it's extremely important that the pilot never lets his trace get tangent to one of these skip-out rays or there's a possibility he will leave the atmosphere, and if he leaves the atmosphere at a velocity above 25,500 feet per second, he will go into an Earth orbit. So he's holding lift vector up here to 6 Gs, and then as the G trace starts to slack off and decrease, the vehicle will have to be rolled 180 degrees to put the lift vector down to prevent violating tangency on the skip-out rays. So the trace looks something like this. It comes down to 6 Gs, pulls up, he will roll lift vector down, he will, he will catch it at about uh, 4 Gs, and the, a constant 4 G profile will then be flown until we come to subcircular velocity, which is less than 25,500 feet per second. From that point on, down to splashdown then, the vehicle will be rolling, lift vector up, lift vector down, to make the target, to make the range to go. While this is going on, by the way, the range counter is counting down all the time. So they know. As I understand it, Walter, as Leo was explaining it to him, uh, from separation until this entry into the atmosphere where the computer takes over, Borman is in charge. He's doing all the flying himself by hand. It's not simply an automatic operation, right? Uh, that's right. The, our FDAI, or Flight Direction Attitude Indicator, at this time is at the entry attitude. Now, for separation, Borman did a 45-degree yaw out of plane with using his rotation hand controller to this point here. Then, at this point, 15 minutes before 05G, he threw his SEP switches, which are these two switches on the panel, which separated uh, the service module. It fires the service module engines to pull it away from the command module. As soon as that maneuver was accomplished, then Borman flew the vehicle back to zero yaw angle again to the proper entry interface. Then he will check out the window to make sure that his 31.7 degree scribe line is on the horizon, and he will, with pitch control, maintain that line on the horizon to ensure that he does have the proper attitude at entry. Thank you, Leo. The, uh, there will be a couple of small skips in the uh, path. Uh, 
uh, for a quick ascent to another 20,000 feet up to 210,000, then come back down and around uh, 40 to 50,000 feet, there'll be another one of these roller coaster effects uh, skipping up another 10,000 feet or so until they finally begin their final uh, straight descent just before the parachutes come out. The reports uh, from the uh, Mission Control Center are it's a very quiet re-entry up to this point. Everything according to Mission Control looking good with the uh, point where they enter the Earth's atmosphere now uh, just uh, eight or uh, six minutes away. One uh, of the, this is uh, Apollo this, Control here. Mission Mission control. We put in a call through the Redstone. Redstone is a tracking right. ship tracking and communications ship there in the mid-Pacific. And they were advised by Ken Mattingly that they were looking good, which they certainly are. The cabin pressure is 4.9 pounds per square inch. The uh, cabin temperature is down a little bit, purposely so. It's uh, down to 61. And most of the flight it ran between 77 and 78 degrees. We're estimating that the crew are still heads down and tracking the uh, horizon visually out their rendezvous, out the windows, any handy window, and uh, letting the GNN system do its, its work. At 146 hours, 41 minutes, this is Apollo Control, Houston. Paul Haney reports that they're traveling head down. They are indeed. That, of course, makes no difference. They're still... They're still head down. They are head down so that they can uh, put that uh, grid on the rendezvous windows about which Leo Krupp told us a moment ago on the horizon and uh, that's one of the ways that they follow themselves down and keep in the proper attitude for re-entry. Re-entry into the atmosphere uh, is now just five minutes away. One of the concerns of course is weather in the landing zone. Uh, we've been told it looks good but Gordon Barnes, our resident weather consultant, can tell us how good or how bad it does look. Well, Walter, this morning down in that particular area, it's really much better than had been originally anticipated. The recovery zone is right in the middle of what is known as the intertropical convergence zone, where you normally have an abundance of warm, moist air, convective clouds, as we meteorologists call it, touching off thunderstorm activity. But during the nighttime hours, for example, this aircraft is, uh, space capsule, excuse me, is coming down at 4.51 in the morning out there, the activity is at its weak point. Consequently, there'll be some very thin clouds up around 20,000 feet, another layer around 12,000, a few scattered clouds around 2,000. There's also a, a few light rain showers still in that particular area. And if any of the rain showers should move over the immediate recovery area, the visibility would be restricted to about five miles per hour. Excuse me, five miles. But uh, generally, visibility will be 10 to 12 miles. Seas running about four feet high. And the air temperature right there is some 80 degrees. Yesterday, the astronauts mentioned that there were some swirling clouds that they noticed on their pictures back of Earth over the nation's midsection. Those swirling clouds are now over the northeastern states, and underneath them we are getting a mixture of snow and sleet and some freezing rain and temperatures ranging from 20 to 25 degrees. So as far as we are concerned here at our Space Weather Center, conditions in the recovery area are nominal, I guess you would call it, Walter. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, it sounds uh, good so far. The big problem out there is going to be the dark. Uh, they are landing for the first time uh, at night. This has never been attempted before, although there have been a lot of practice uh, uh, recovery sessions at night out in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, beyond Houston, Texas there. Uh, Jim Lovell spent 48 hours bobbing around, uh, so he had two nighttime passes, and, uh, and a lot of practice has been given to nighttime recovery. The actual recovery will not be attempted during the dark hours. Uh, it's only a few, uh, about 40 minutes uh, before first light should be expected after they are landing, and uh, the swimmers will not be dropped from the helicopters uh, until first light, unless Borman, Lovell, or Anders uh, request uh, help during the night. The Navy would prefer to wait until daylight. For one thing, sharks in those waters are a little more uh, vicious, voracious, uh, in the pre-dawn hours than they are after light. The helicopters will be summoned to the side of the spacecraft by a visual beacon and by radio beacons, and uh, they will uh, hover overhead during those 40 minutes with large searchlights playing upon the spacecraft in the uh, four-foot waves of the Pacific, but they will not actually attempt the recovery of the astronauts until first light. 
CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 8 will continue in a moment.